Hello everyone, in this video I'll introduce you to the PIG microcontroller datasheets and explain how registers work and how we can read from or write to them. So, let's get started. Datasheets are the core parts when trying to learn any chip, especially for microcontrollers. They are the main way for the chip producers to talk to you and explain the workings of their chip. Not every datasheet are equal though. Nowadays datasheets include way more graphical information like diagrams and just more explanations in general. So older chips have lacking datasheets, which is another downside to them. However, even though I have nothing to do with microchip, I can tell you that most microchip datasheets that I've read, even the older ones, have been great. So that is definitely something microchip is good at. If you have a question, you'll likely find your answers somewhere in here. Don't forget that you can always use Ctrl and F shortcut to bring up the search bar to type the term you are looking for. Let's look at the datasheet of our microcontroller, which as you know is PIC18F46K22. And you can easily find this or any other datasheet by typing the microcontroller's name, followed by datasheet on Google. This X means that it can be replaced by any number, meaning this datasheet refers to any microcontroller that fits this description. And this slash means that the name can be both 2XK22 and 4XK22. This first section, which may extend a couple of pages, shows you the general feature set of the microcontroller, its capabilities and speed, analog features, peripherals, and more. I won't go into these since I'll be making a separate video for each peripheral in the future. Let's scroll down. Next up are the list of microcontrollers that this datasheet can refer to, as well as their differences. For example, the 18F4 chips have 11 more analog inputs than 18F2 chips, or 18F46K22 has double the programming memory of 18F45K22. Next up are your pin locations, which I'll refer to as pinouts from now on. The names on the diagram header tell you which microcontroller they refer to, and the same microcontroller can have multiple packaging options as well. Our microcontroller uses 40 pin DIP packaging, so we can come here and refer to this diagram to find the pins we're looking for. But this diagram doesn't show you the capabilities of the pins. Some pinout diagrams will show you these capabilities on them, but there are too many for this microcontroller to fit here. It's typical that the datasheet has it on another list, which is exactly what's next. This list shows you what each pin is capable of. They can be configured as simple I.O., meaning input-output, or to any of these features depending on your needs. Be careful that there can be multiple lists for different microcontrollers like this, since they don't have the same pinout. We are using 18F46K22, so let's navigate to this list instead. You can see these different pinouts here. For example, the RA0 pin is in the second pin on our DIP packaging, but it would have been pin 17 for UQFN packaging. You can see from here that this pin has I.O. capability, analog capability, and a capability that has to do with a comparator, which we'll talk about in the future. Also, be wary that there may be notes at the bottom of lists, which you'll know you need to refer to if the option you're looking for has these parentheses on them, telling you which node is relevant to it. And next up is table of contents. Unless the datasheet is older, you should be able to click them to jump to their page, like this. I'll skip this part, it's just a letter for customers. This part explains the future set of the microcontroller further and elaborates more on them. This is the general simplified block diagram, telling you what is connected to where. You don't really have to worry about this if you don't understand. It'll be easier to grasp when you know what each individual part does. Here, the pins of the microcontrollers are explained further, instead of just using abbreviations. So the functionality about that comparator for RA0 was that this pin can be configured as the inverting input for those comparators. Be careful here, some pins can be open drain only, which means the pin can only be pulled low and can't be set to high voltage. You can google open drain output for more information about that. Also, some pins may be input only, like the MCLR pin. Some microcontrollers won't let you disable the MCLR capability, which is used to reset the microcontroller externally. But this microcontroller does allow for that option, and you can use this pin as RE3, but it's only limited to being an input, meaning it can't be used as an output pin. After this point, the datasheet starts explaining the modules, so I'll stop here for now. And again, I'll teach each module in their own separate videos in the future. But before that, let's talk about how we can use these modules and how we configured them for our needs. I've said many of times that microcontrollers consist of registers, which further consist of individual bits. Registers are essentially a group of transistors that we can change or read the state of. They connect to other transistors and enable, disable or configure modules that they are connected in a certain way too. 
Now, I won't go any deeper into this, but we essentially load values to certain registers, which as you know, consist of bits, which can be either 1 or 0, to change or configure the states of the modules or the microcontroller itself. Microcontrollers can't move around a bit like you might think. Microcontrollers work with registers, and for an 8-bit microcontroller, the native register size will be 8 bits long, so we'll update registers 8 bits at a time, reading their description to determine what should be cleared or set. And again, remember that set means to turn into 1, and clear means to turn into 0. Now take a look at this table for example. You'll see this kind of table a lot. I won't explain it since I'll go into details about it in a future video. But this is the table for OSCCon register. And as you can see, it consists of 8 bits since this is an 8-bit microcontroller, and each part can only be 1 or 0 since they represent a single bit. The R and W you see up here stand for read and write respectively, these bits can be both read from or written to since they have both R and W written above them. But these two bits, for example, only have R, meaning they are read only. This means that you can't change the state of these bits, instead you can only read their status. And if you read their description, they are not configuration bits, they don't exactly configure anything. They are what we call status bits, telling you the status of a certain part in the microcontroller. You can still try to write to these bits, it won't break anything, it will just simply be ignored. The number after the dash represents the default state. These registers will not store data permanently, meaning they are volatile. This means that if the microcontroller powers off or resets, these registers will also be reset and will need configuration again. These numbers represent the default state of these bits on startup or reset. The Q here means that there is no default state, it depends on the status of the microcontroller, and there are explanations for each symbol I didn't mention here as well. You'll also see names for each group of bits like IDLEN or IRCF and etc. These represent the group of bits that configure a certain part of a module inside of the register. For example, IDLEN stands for Idle Enable Bit and configures the idle mode of the microcontroller. Or IRCF, which stands for Internal RC Oscillator Frequency Select Bits, which are the group of bits that configure the oscillator frequency. It's common for multiple bits to be grouped up like this to configure something with more than two options. And by naming these configurations, both the datasheet and you can refer to them easier. You'll also commonly see these symbols. These just mean from this bit to this bit. Meaning for this term, it means from bit 0 to bit 2 of IRCF. It also informs you of how many bits this configuration group spans. As for how to read from or write to these registers, I'll explain them in MPLAB IDE. I'll just create a new project. I already showed you how to create a project in a previous video, so I'll fast forward. Let's again make a source file called main, which will house our special main function. You'll quickly see that MPLAB wrote the main function automatically, but it also added the xc.h library. Let's talk about this elephant in the room that is xc.h library. It uses angled brackets when being included, so you should know that this library comes with the compiler. Now, if we click on this, things will get complicated to explain since it's like a rabbit's hole of including and defining that won't make sense to us. Instead, I'll just explain what it does. Every register has an address in the microcontroller that you go to to do your writing operation, which you can find in the datasheet if you navigate to register map section. For example, the OSCCon register I just used is on this address, and the addresses will be different for each microcontroller, even if the register names are identical. This is where the beauty of coding in C comes in. Instead of looking at the addresses, we can include this xc.h library, which has all the lists that contain register names and their addresses for all microcontrollers. It will define the name of registers and link them to their addresses for your project's selected microcontroller, so you can just type the register names to access them. For example, let's comment this line out and type osccon and write a value into it. Don't forget that you have to put this 0b to the beginning of your number to write it as a binary. This gives us an error if we try to build it telling us that OSCCon is not defined. But if I uncomment this line back, OSCCon is defined and the program can be compiled without a problem. This xc.h library is therefore essential and should be included in all source files that reference a register. If you name a register like this, you will refer to the whole register, meaning you'll have to write to every single bit that is inside of this register when doing this write operation. To begin with, you can't actually update a single bit like you might think you'll instead have to read from or write to the whole register since the microcontrollers don't work with bits, they work with registers. Let's say you wanted to set the first bit of this register without changing the rest of the bits. How would you do it? You would just read the register, then use bitwise operations like I taught you in the bitwise operations video, to manipulate the bits. 
To set the first bit, you can use the OR operation. Then you can load this value back onto the register and there you go. And how do you read an individual bit? Let's say you wanted to read the third bit of this register. First, you would read the whole register, like this. Let's say that the register returns this value. But you want to extract this third bit's value as a 0 or 1. Then you would just shift this value to the right by 2, right? But there is still extra information that you need to get rid of. For that, you can use the AND operation to clear every bit but the first one, which is the bit you're looking for. And there you go. This is the messy way to do it, which you won't actually use, but I wanted to show it anyways to teach you how it's actually done. The exe.h library also has the individual bit groups of the registers defined. To access the subgroups of a register, type the register name, then type bits, and put a dot. Now you can write the group name yourself, or click one from the list that pops up. For example, we can choose id len and directly make it 0 or 1, and the compiler will handle the operation above for us instead. And no, the operation above can't be escaped. Again, microcontrollers work with registers, not individual bits. The same also goes for the read operation, like this. You can also choose options that are multiple bits long, like the IRCF group. You know that this group is 3 bits long, so you can just type out those 3 bits like this. The value doesn't have to be 8 bits long, since the rest will just be truncated and ignored anyways. If you didn't understand all these bitwise operations and binary numbers that I've just used, I'll put a link down below for the two-part video I've made where I talk about them extensively. I suggest watching it if you didn't understand anything. Now you should know what registers are and how we use them to configure our microcontroller. And you should know how to refer and use these registers in your code as well. So I think it's time we start configuring things and start writing codes, starting from configuration bits, which I'll talk about in the next video. And that's the end of the video, and thank you for watching. If you liked the video, you can always leave a like and subscribe, it's always appreciated, and I'll see you in the next video.